even though he's right across right? on the other side of the village, his internet is Here's Ryan. exceeding. Oh, yeah, so we have Ryan. Much slower than mine <laughs> so is. I feel bad. Like, sorry. Okay. Like, Isn't that amazing how that works? Netflix? <laughs> wow. I will wait for him. All right. So it's 6 32. I'm going to call this meeting of the. Ryan. We're going to call this meeting of the no, Montpelier Roxbury right Board of School Commissioners to order. Um, Jim has been unavoidably detained, but he will probably join us later. Yes, oh, we have Ryan. Ryan. Much slower than mine <laughs> so is. I feel bad. Like, sorry. Okay. Um, it's like, okay. Amazing. I think the first order of business <laughs> is to add something to the agenda. Wow. I will wait. For uh, all right. So it's six thirty-two. Maybe distributed to everyone. We're call the this meeting of, of the proposed um, right. statement for the board. We're to call this meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Commissioners to order. So um, Jim has been unavoidably to amend the agenda to we'll probably join us later. later. Yeah, so I think it was much slower than mine is. I feel bad. Sorry. I think the first order of business is to add something to the agenda. I will wait. All right. So it's second. Maybe distributed to everyone. Call this meeting of the host. All right. Any discussion? This meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board is just the agenda. Statement. Jim has been unavoidably to amend the agenda. Okay. So we're going to take a vote. And actually, this will also count for the role that I should. Bridget AC, Vice Chair, I'm here, but then I'm going to take roll. Uh, Emma? Here. And your vote on the um, amending Aye. the agenda? Thanks. Uh, Anikit, vote on amending the agenda? Aye, and I'm here. Mara? Aye. Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Great. So, for the record, we have Emma Bay Hansen, Anakit, Mara, Jill, Andrew, Jerry, and Ryan all present at the outset of the meeting, along with Libby and Anna. Um, the next item is the consent agenda. Anyone want to pull anything out of the consent agenda? Bridget, I don't see any public here, but do you want to? Uh, All right, you're right. If we need to call it. There's no public here, but yeah. Um, public comment does come before the consent agenda. Thanks for the catch. I don't see any public, but if we're mistaken, looking at the chat, no? Okay, no public being present. There'll be no public comment. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, no one is asking to pull anything out. So will anyone move to approve the consent agenda, including the additions um, with respect to the additional hire that um, Anna added today? I'll make a motion to approve today's consent agenda, including the additional hiring form and the warrants. I'll second it. Great. Any, uh, well, no discussion. It's consent agenda, so we'll just go through the roll again, Emma. Aye. Anakit? Aye. Mara? Aye. Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Great. Uh, so the next item of business is the statement. Um, I was actually going to move that, but since I'm acting as chair, maybe someone else could move that we adopt it. In order to discuss it, we need to have a motion to adopt it in a second, and then we can move on to discussing it. Do you want me to share my screen, Bridget, so I can share it? That'd be great. Then the public could see it. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. You see it? Yes. yes. Does the statement have a particular title that we would need to say uh, that we move to adopt the statement dot, dot, dot? Bridget, I'll go quick. I'll make a motion that the board adopt the presented, the drafted statement. Great, is there a second? Second. Thanks, okay. Um, so we can open that up for discussion now. I, I think it's an extremely I think it's an extremely powerful statement. I saw earlier an early uh, 
clear draft of this and I submitted comments to Jim on it. And then I saw, I think Bridget, you're, I think you rewrote most of this. Is that correct? I re I edited Jim's initial proposal to try to bring in our mission statement and some of the history around the students that advocated for the flag yeah. two years ago, but it was a definitely a joint effort. Um, yeah, I really, I really appreciated the, the student component to this. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I 110% support, support this statement. Um, I, I don't have much more to say on with regard to supporting the statement. I think it pretty much speaks for itself. Yeah, I agree. I think you guys did a fantastic job. It, it's, uh, it's great, comprehensive and just, um, yeah, I appreciate the work you did on this. Thanks. So one problem I'm having, maybe someone can help me on this Zoom issue, is that when, when we share screens, I can't see everyone's video, even in oh, grid mode. Click the so little I can't tell plus. if people are like, what do we do? Click the little, do you see a little box with you in it? There mm -hmm. should be a little plus. Um, icon on that box if you click that plus icon it will expand to put everyone in little boxes you see it are you on a desktop window no i'm on a laptop okay laptop you don't have to spend a lot of time on this i just wanted to be clear that i can't tell if everything if, there if might be people trying to talk and i can't see you to recognize okay. you so yeah if you see a little plus icon i don't um, anywhere then you that's the other you, thing uh bridget if you see um like if you hover over the box where you do see any video it should yep. say you probably have um it says something like speaker view or gallery view and if you click on yeah. that you, you might switch yeah. and then yeah. if you put it in grid and expand like if you it depends on if the document's the main thing on your screen or not Oh yeah, if you can ah, that like, did yeah. it. I got it. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for the <laughs> sorry for the problem. Um, I would like to just give a shout out to the Superintendents Association, the School Boards Association, and the Principals Association, who I thought put out a really great statement as well earlier, either today or mm -hmm. late yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. yeah. But that was great to see. Other comments on this statement? Um, I <clears throat> Appreciated that um, the last sentence about we recommit. You can't see it in the in the screen view. I don't know if you can scroll down. Yep, got it. Um, but committing to take uh, concrete action, I really appreciate that, and um, was hopeful maybe that we could eventually come up with a list of action items um, that we will be prioritizing. Um, this is Annika. Uh, yeah, I um, I had a similar comment. First of all, uh, I, I really appreciate you guys putting this together. It's a, a I echo the sentiment. It's a powerful statement, and um, I wholeheartedly support it. Um, I replied to Jim, and there are a couple of things I mentioned, um, especially about the the last line um, when we are saying we recommit the district to taking concrete steps. One of the things I was wondering whether, whether we should add what we are doing right now. Um, the F-22, the policy that we have, has some language in it, that, that stuff that we're doing to address racism and, and um, uh, diversity. And I was wondering if we should add that and then put in some uh, few points about what we are, what, we, what additional steps we are gonna take. I mean, it's a great statement on its own, um, I was wondering if if that would uh, uh, warrant adding or putting that additional information in the statement. So, Libby, other thoughts? You, uh, Libby, did you mention that there was something like there might not be the time to do that right now? But yeah, I was worried about it for the school board. That's all. I was worried about it for this meeting. That's all. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's what I meant when I responded to you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just want, I would like to say that um, 
I'm as always very proud and impressed with this board for their immediate action on um, this particular topic. It's a subject, and I do I do want to make make this day. It's a subject that Anna and I have talked about of where does the district stand, and I'm, I come to the conundrum of of statement versus action as a district, and and um, I can issue statements coming from me right as as this is not certainly dealing with two crises is not easy <laughs> and we have two crises right now um and so um so i gran and i have definitely gone back and forth a couple times this this week of what what do we do do we make a statement or do we continue the work that we have been go doing um and we are taking considerable action right now um, one of which I'll talk about in a minute, but just, you know, the one that comes to mind is, is when teachers are, are doing the work in the six days that I got for them for professional learning without students and they're designing units of study, we have an equity overlay on that. So they're considering what case studies they're using, what perspectives they're using, what authors they're using, what, you know, some things that force teachers thinking to get out of their normal. Um, and so, so there's, there's definitely things we're doing, um, but I, I just wanted to say that I very much appreciate the board stepping up to make this statement and I'm behind it 100%. Um, and, and there's no but to this. And right now there's two crises that we're dealing with right now. So, so I appreciate that the board's stepping up to do this. Yeah, so um, to answer the question, maybe we could come up with what we're doing maybe we could help you with that libby and either link to it or or put it as an addendum to the statement or something like that and we could just say these are a few of the things we wouldn't have to be um to spend a whole lot of time on it well, I, I have a question for um libby and the board so we have our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, which really lays the groundwork for a lot of um, concrete action on this. I don't, I wonder if it would make sense to receive an update on how we're doing on the, those areas of the policy. Um, would that make sense? You mean an update now or an update at our next board meeting? I was going to say at our next board meeting because I don't want to overwhelm our our right, superintendent. Um, yes. that's, that's what I was. Got. Andrew, we've crossed the line of overwhelmingness. So don't, don't worry <laughs> about that. That was crossed a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, that was that was my general thought. Um, I don't know what people think. I'm just putting that out there. I think it's definitely <laughs> some. I mean, if I'm a Bridget, if you don't mind, sure. I think when we we our next meeting is the board retreat on the 12th where we have a lot of time to digest and talk um and i think it would behoove the board um to just spend some time with with that policy to talk about exactly what is it that we're looking for i also think it might we might benefit from the week that you're talking about the professional development week and possibly creating some sort of um google spreadsheet or something for the staff to just quickly go in there and type a couple of things that they're personally working on in their classrooms i know that i'm sure that the staff could populate the, the action list a lot faster than you could on your own <laughs> Absolutely. And our our district wide equity team today started brainstorming um, a similar statement, but they were also grappling with the we have a lot of work to do internally as a predominantly white district. Um, and and so we don't. Yes, we want to make a statement and we want to continue the work internal. Um, so they're they were kind of grappling with that all day today. Um, but I think they landed on the idea that they were going to collaboratively, collaboratively come out with something um, from the district perspective and also reconvene June 10th, uh, which is our next equity team meeting, to, to further discuss where are we right now and what are we doing. 
So it sounds like the challenge in adding more detail to this statement is timing, that it would be difficult to do it on the fly right now. And if we want to adopt something tonight, that might be difficult. Is that, uh, that seems... My my general thought is the, the type of detail that Anna Kit's requesting is something that I think is totally appropriate and very valuable for a board to be requesting in terms of what we we want some concrete details on this. We we need this spelled out. I don't know that it has to be in this statement. In fact, sometimes statements are stronger when they're shorter and straight to the point addressing an issue. Um, but uh, so what I would propose at our next meeting, not only talking about how we're doing these things, but providing those types of details to the board so that then the board, when we, we're talking with community members about the work that we're doing with this, we can, we can then provide additional details to our community. And there's nothing that precludes us from writing additional op-eds on these issues and from, can you, and we should be continuing to follow up on these issues. But as a statement um, and staying, you know, current with the situation today and letting our community know that, you know, we, we really care about this issue, these issues, and we're, we're committing our resources and our policies in, in this direction. I think, I think there is va value in getting something out sooner rather than later. And I think we could also potentially even add a sentence along the lines of um, you can look for the actions that we're taking on these issues in and then where are the places that they could see the action? Is it on the website? Um, are, will it be forthcoming in a report from uh, from Libby? Will it be in another statement somewhere? If we could give them a little bit of a forecast for where to look for the information that we're going to tell them about you know, what we're doing, I think that might suffice for a get it out on the fly, but also acknowledge that we know you want to see what we're doing. Here's where you should look. <laughs> now is not the time to throw it in the letter. That's a great suggestion, Mara. I know Anna's ears are perking up. I can see her face and I know what she's thinking right now. <laughs> That's a great subjection or uh, uh, suggestion. Yeah, that would be I, I, something that um, kind of accompanies the statement, but isn't. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Uh, so I was saying, is that something that would uh, kind of accompany the statement as it goes out the door, goes on, you know, gets sent out to the families, but not necessarily right in the text of it, because then we don't have to write it tonight. I would suggest that the, I, I think you've written a, a beautiful statement here and that when it goes out either through my means in terms of district-wide communication that I have and um, social media access that we put a statement of, of, of um, we are ready to be, be as transparent as possible in the actions that the district has taken. Stay tuned for more information. If that's if I'm understanding correctly, I think yeah. I think spending some time at the retreat on the twelfth um, with Anna as our communication expert and myself for just ex just so we're one hundred percent clear as to the board's expectations from that policy. Just so just as another time to talk about it because um, nothing about this is easy or simple, um, and no. I think the more time we can talk about it, it's not it's hard. Yeah, I think the more time we can talk about the complexities and the expectations, the better off we'll be in terms of being clear about the work and being clear about your expectations for what you'd like to be um, to happen. So with that understanding of how the statement would be conveyed, um, is there any further discussion? Also, just to circle back, to Mara and Anakin, does that sound like a good plan to you too? Yeah. <clears throat> I think Mara's frozen. I think she is, yeah. Or she's very still, one of the two. Okay. Do 
Shall we make a motion to move forward? Uh, there's a motion on the table. Um, so we'll just call the question. I don't want to cut off Mara. Um, I'm just going to write it in the chat. Let me see if I have her number. I did also just want to thank you guys for writing this. I thought it was a beautiful statement. I'm proud to be Thanks, part of it. Jim. I was glad that Jim, I'm really glad that Jim prompted it. He should, although he's not here, he should be recognized for um, for starting the conversation in the draft. Mara's back. I can see her blinking. Yeah, okay. sorry. I was <laughs> like, why is no one answering <laughs> Oh, I am frozen, crazy. my friend. Yeah. <laughs> You look very, very calm and sedate, though, while you're frozen. <laughs> yes. Well, I, the funny thing was, I thought everyone was, are we collectively reading the statement right now? Because everyone else looked really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom fun. Okay, so, Mara, you're okay with moving forward? Yes. All right. Okay, uh, we'll start, we'll take the vote. Emma? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mara? Aye. I think I got everybody. Okay. Do we need to read it into the record somehow or anything? Anna's got it. We can link it. Okay. And uh, uh, so, Bridge, just so I'm clear, would you like us to spread this out via our our communication methods tomorrow? Yes, I would say yes. Okay, Anna, get that on our to-do list tomorrow. She's like my second brain. <laughs> All right, going back to check the agenda here. I think we're moving on to the reports. Um, so we have two policy monitoring reports. The first one is volunteers and work study students. Any discussion or question on those? Um, Libby, are you still sharing your screen? Yeah. Do you want me to stop? Yeah, I think so. Not seeing any uh, questions about the volunteer policy um, or the report. The other one is about the um, interdistrict elementary school transfer policy. I can provide a little bit of background on this in case folks aren't um, familiar. When we when the districts merged together, that was the first time we needed a policy to address intradistrict transfers because it was the first time we had two schools that have the same age students in them. Um, and we looked at other policies and other, you know, some really large districts, well, large for Vermont, like Burlington, you know, they have kind of complicated policies around transferring, you know, between schools. Um, we did not opt for a complicated approach because we didn't really know what was gonna happen. And um, my recollection, uh, those of who were here can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the main concern we had in a, point at which we had no idea what would happen is if there were requests to transfer from Roxbury to Union, Union Roxbury could become untenable if there with even just a very small number of transfers of kids out of Roxbury. And that's why the standard in the policy is pretty high. Um, I don't think that happened. I, mean, we don't, I don't think we have gotten those requests. One, Libby but we were operating at a point where we really just had no idea. And we knew that the numbers in Roxbury, it was critical to have a critical mass there to keep the school tenable. Um, that's where the policy came from. Any questions about that monitoring report? A motion to approve the monitoring reports. I think we can do them together. I move to approve the monitoring reports. Second. I'll second. Thanks. Uh, Emma? 
Aye. Anakit? Aye. Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mara? Aye. Thank you. Um, yeah, it looks like Jim may not be able to join us. Libby and I are getting the same text. Not a great day there. Okay. Uh, going back to the agenda here. Libby, I think that we're turning to you for the COVID-19 update. Do we have a copy of this for future reference? Of the COVID-19 slides? Yeah. Did I send them to you? I, yeah, they're in the did. email, I think. You sent the link, yes. Yeah, I looked at them earlier. Yeah, I thought I did. They've changed a little bit because I've updated the survey information. Andrew, did they send, did they go to you? They might have. I might have missed them. I'm, I'm not. I'm I, I definitely, I, it's easier for me when I have a, so I don't just vomit information at you all, when I have uh, the slide to organize my thinking. Yeah, um, I found it. But I want to keep them as up to date as possible, which is why I'm not putting them in the board packet, but um, It's fine. Know. It's great. Yeah. I have, I have them. I, I just missed them. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that, Andrew. Okay. No. So. Um, if you all have questions, then um, feel free to stop me and ask me on the way. That's absolutely fine. Um, so this is where we are now. Uh, we, I don't have anybody with us right now. Our administrative team is working really hard, and I wanted to make sure they take care of themselves because we're all a little um, stressed and overwhelmed right now. So I did not have them come to the board meeting, but I'm happy to answer any questions I can. If I don't know the answer, then I will find them out for you. Um, so as we move so right now we are in significant planning for the fall um, the way that we've broken this up is that we're trying to plan for the six days of professional learning first um, to make sure that that is as targeted as we can make it for our teachers um, and then we're moving into other things um, after that um, i did a town hall meeting with about 80 85 people uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Um, and I gathered some themes for that. I sent out a survey yesterday to parents and students. Um, and so here are the themes that have been gathered so far from that information. And like I said, I was literally updating this about 10 minutes ago, so or 15 minutes ago. Um, so it's, it's as up-to-date as I can. And these are themes. Um, so keep that in mind. It does not represent everything that we've gotten so far, but they are themes. So from our teachers, I had a similar town hall meeting with our teachers um, a couple of weeks ago. And the things that came out of that was that they really wanted to focus the learning and prioritize the learning. So we are not going for breadth, but we're going for depth. Um, there is an eagerness to co-teach in new and different ways. And when I say co-teach, I don't mean the traditional special education co-teach necessarily. I mean, multidisciplinary co-teaching, um, which would be super cool, I think. Um, there's an interest in developing knowledge base and project-based learning with multiple entry points for kids to make it as accessible for all kids as possible. Our teachers desperately want to be in person um, and anxiety is running really high for some of them. So um trying to figure out how to make both of those things work is a big challenge right now there's a lot of concerns about the logistics because we our profession and our expertise is kids and we know what kids need to grow and we know what kids need to learn and we know what kids need to just be kids and a lot of the information coming to us right now quite honestly contradicts all of what we know so there's a considerable concern over the logistics and how we make this work for what we know is best for kids. Um, 
I can't state that enough. And uh, there was definitely an, a want and a desire for consistency in online platforms across the district so that parents, if they have kids in multiple schools, uh, have a same platform for like an organizational bucket for things. There's a need for that. I'm going to move you all to the other side of my screen here. Okay. From the parents so far, um, the information from the parents honestly just proves to me what an absolutely impossible task this is. Um, so if there's a if there's a progression scale or a, a Likert scale of where parents are, our parents are evenly spaced across that scale from um, hating every second of this to never wanting our kids to be ever in school um, until there's a vaccine. And there is equal representation across that line. There is no one solid group of parents that wants one thing over another. I'm just going to be honest. Um, the survey information is incredibly clear about that. And I, I will be looking at that and organizing it in a way for you all as a school board for the board retreat so you can see that as well. Um, but so far, some of the themes, um, when we're talking about in-person versus remote versus some sort of hybrid, there's no agreement. There's a lot of worry about the environment um, that would be too restrictive if we were in-person and not what's best for kids, similar to the teachers. Um, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of people saying, do not go remote because it didn't work um, for my kid. There's some that's saying it was better. So it's, it's really all over the map. Um, parents want kids outside as much as possible. Um, and I keep have the caveat in my head of we live in Vermont, so that's possible for about three months out of the year. Um, and it's it's hard because we have standards that we have to that we're by law required to teach. So it's it's difficult. Um, they parents want kids to be with the teachers, regardless of the learning context. And when I say that, they mean, um, the theme that I'm seeing is that they want um, live interaction with the teachers. It doesn't matter if you're remote or if you're in person. The live interaction is incredibly important to parents. Um, their parents are really worried about any type of staggered schedule because of child care needs. Our teachers are worried about that as well for their own personal world. Um, there's, we have many different needs depending on um, if a if a parent has a child at, at K-4 versus 5-8 versus 9-12, um, they, a lot of stress on uh, the learning more personalized for individual kids. And this is, a, this is a definitive theme that our parents have very high expectations for our schools, which I do as well. I share that and their kids, and that doesn't change regardless of the learning context that they're in. Um, and that is a most definitive theme across the board with, with all parents. We want excellence, that's our goal. We need to get it regardless of the learning context. Um, from our kids, um, like I said to some who are jumping in early, this is a highlight of my day reading the student surveys today, particularly from our littles. So the big, the big things are is that our kids miss their friends big time. Like it doesn't matter if they're a six year old or an 18 year old, they miss their friends. Um, remote lear learning, the kids are reporting that it's worked for a few. It's funny, the kids are reporting that it's worked more than the parents are. <laughs> um, and others are reporting that this has not worked at all for them. And they are very adamant about that. Um, some feel that they have adequate access to their teachers and some don't. Uh, the workload was either just right, not enough, or too much. It's the Goldilocks syndrome there. Um, most of them are saying they miss school and it's very nice that most of them say, I didn't expect to miss school, but I do. <laughs> I miss it more than I could possibly ever have imagined. Um, and the biggest reasons are the teachers and their friends. Uh, many, many, many are saying they loved being with their family more and being with their parents uh, more than they have before. And they didn't, this was a theme that I just added at the end is that um, students were, a lot of students reported that they were frustrated with the wait time with email. So they'd have a trouble with their learning and they'd email a teacher and then they'd have to wait for that teacher to reply to them, even if it was just for a couple hours or a day. That was really frustrating for our students. So those are the themes that we've gathered so far from our survey data and our town hall data. Um, again, I'm going to figure out how to organize this all. 
um, with my friend Anna's help, and we <laughs> will get that information. We'll spend some time with this data at the retreat. Typically, we spend time with academic data and scores. We don't have those this year, so we'll spend some more time with this data um, at our retreat and next week, two weeks, week and a half. Um, so I wanted to share with you how we're making decisions going forward. We started this process about two weeks, two weeks ago. Um, we have three teams in our district. So I just wanna make sure everybody's clear on our definitions here. So the full league are our principals, assistant principals, central office administration, and our two district-wide coaches, Sarah Berger, Berger and Mary Bechtel. So they're, teacher, they're on the teacher's contract, but they're part of the full league. The core team is myself, Mike Berry, Mary Lundine, Bill Dice, who is taking over for Mary and Grant Geisler. So it's that core team, central office administration. Um, and then the teacher implementation team are teachers that uh, volunteered to provide feedback to these decision points. We have approximately 20 on that team um, that are giving me rapid feedback. So this is the process. I believe I may have shared this with you before. What we're trying to do is break down all of these massive decisions we need to make into the smallest scale possible so that they are doable and we can gain some confidence in our teaching staff around them. And they're going through multiple feedback rounds quickly. So they go through core team quickly, then they go through the principals in 24 hours, then they go through the teacher implementation team, then they go back to the principals, then they go back to the core team. And each time we're making revisions on those. So in the first uh, two or three weeks of this process, it worked well. We would focus solely on, the on those six days in June so that we could really target those days and make them really good for our teachers and what we needed. And um, now it's it, in the background work, we're starting to switch to fall 2020. Um, but having said that, there are, there are way more unknowns than there are knowns right now. We have not gotten any guidance from the Agency of Education yet about what the um, fall, what the rules are going to be for fall 2020. We do have the CDC guidance that came out in May, uh, but that was representing the realities of May. Um, and, and so we need to, we're using that as our guide right now, but it could change tomorrow based on a phone call with Dan French. Um, so we do have a process in place for this. Um, I just wanna remind everybody in the community that our goal at Montpelier Roxbury and the soapbox that I will forever stand on is that all kids will learn at high levels because of what we do every single day. The learning context does not matter for me that we will continue to ensure that kids live at, learn at high levels. That has not happened this spring, and I'm the first to admit that. We're in crisis mode. We're, still, we're getting through that crisis mode, but there's different expectations for fall 2020. So I just wanted to remind everybody about this piece. And then also our theory of action. Our theory of action does not change regardless of the learning context doesn't change if we're remote, it doesn't change if we're hybrid, it doesn't change if we're in-person. And our theory of action is that all kids will learn at high levels if we have, collect, we have evidence of collective responsibility and collaborative practices amongst our teachers. Our jobs are complex as educators, and if we work together collaboratively, it will be better. Um, we will be able to do it. If we work as individuals, we're not gonna get there. We need to have the collaborative brilliance of our teachers and our administrators that we have high quality instruction in every single, it says every classroom on this. I've kind of changed my mantra in here to every child, high quality, and chi and high quality instruction for every child. Because right now we don't have classrooms. <laughs> we may, it may be different. So we need to change that vernacular a little bit. Our third piece of our theory of action is that we need a timely system to enrich, intervene and remediate. This becomes even more important and I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, and our last one is formalized essential learning. Prioritize that learning, focusing in on really what are the have to knows. Um, so if you've been on the board for a while, you've seen this diagram before. Um, and this is, this is our theory of action that if we have these four things in place, all kids will learn at high levels. There are many other things that go into it, but these are the baselines. These are the pieces that everything else stands on um, as we go forward. And what we realized through the last month, the leadership team, is that these don't change. 
and that it doesn't matter what kind of crisis we're in, we have to think about what these four things are and keep coming back to them. So, oops, sorry. So over June 12th through June 19th, when um, kids are on summer vacation and our teachers are there six days, we've taken those four pillars that we stand on and thought, what is it that we really need to do? And really we've taken our theory of action that we've, ha we've developed in the last two years and we're putting it on steroids and we're getting it really moving fast. So for formalized essential learning, we're gonna ensure that there's prioritized standards in each air content area, no more than six for the entire year. So when we're talking about our priorities, it's essential to understand that we're talking about the, the standards that we are going to guarantee every single kid learns and understands. That's what, it's not about um, how we're teaching it. It's not about where we're teaching it. It's not about the context in which we're teaching it. It's about standards that we're required to teach by law. We're focusing in on those and naming no more than six. I, Emma, I saw your hand up. Go for it. I just wanted to let you know that your audio is a little funny. I think that there might be something touching the microphone of your computer. Oh, thank you for letting me know that. Is that better? I'm going to keep my hands free. Is that better? Okay. Tell me again if that, if that messes up. I don't know where my mic is actually in my computer. Um, okay. So we're going to focus and prioritize those standards. Um, we've already done a lot of that work but we're gonna make sure that we have the six right ones over this time. And then we're gonna design units of study using backwards design. So basically starting with what we want kids to know and going backwards for the six weeks of school, regardless of the learning content. This includes social emotional learning, it includes academic learning, it includes relationship building, all of this. We're gonna put teachers in their teams to decide on what that's gonna look like. We have a lot of brand spanking, just graduated from college, new teachers coming on board. And um, this is just going to help them move forward, as well as ha have our teachers hit the ground running as soon as August starts. Go ahead, Jill. Just for myself and anyone who might be listening, could you just maybe define what universal backwards design? Yeah, it's coming out of um, the work of Grant Wiggins and McTeague. And what they... Um, it's been around for a while, but it's a way of designing units of study that start with the end. So you start with the end in mind. So if, if the end, I was a second grade teacher. So if the end is that kids will show um, basic inferential skills in chapter books, if that's, that's the end in mind, then I'm going to work back in a unit of study to think, what, do I, what are the bends in the road that I need to teach in order to get kids to that end of that unit? Um, and so it includes uh, what formative assessments, what learning opportunities I'm going to make for the kids, um, where are they going to dig deep in, in pieces, uh, how are we going to use that formative assessment data to reteach when kids don't get it, uh, as well as, uh, I totally just lost my train of thought, can't remember where I was going, but it was the end, it's the end in mind. Um, oh, sorry. We also have with that an equity uh, overlay for that. So when we were talking about the actions that the school district is going to take, I mentioned this earlier, in addition to planning our bends in the road and our formative assessments, when we're thinking about the context in which we're getting kids to learn, we're think, we have an equity overlay of what authors are you using, what books are you using, what, what uh, case studies are you using, how are you ensuring multiple perspectives are coming into play, if that's appropriate for the unit of study. Um, all of those things particularly come into play a lot in the humanities and science in particular. Um, so our teachers are going to be spending times in teams doing that. This is not new work at all. It's just ensuring that the work is done and is done well. Um, we're also talking about a timely system to intervene, re remediate, or enrich. So it is a, we can predict that kids will come into school next year and quite honestly any year. It doesn't matter if we have COVID happening or not, that some kids will already know the grade level standard that we're working on. Some kids will need more time with the grade level standard than what we're giving them. And we need to ensure that they have that time for reteach to make sure they learn it. We also know that some kids have gaps or holes, what I call universal skills, that they need to really hit on in order to access the grade level curriculum. 
and and we have not done an excellent job. And when I say we, I mean educators as a whole, not just Montpelier Roxbury, at making sure that we have evidence that our system to interview and remediate and enrich, enrich works. Um, so what we are saying this year is that every school with a master schedule allowing for the remediation of those universal skills and enrichment activities for those who have the universal skills mastered, as well as reteaching or intervention opportunities for the priority standards. Every school will have that. Currently, we don't have it, but next year we will. What we know going into next year is that kids are going to move up a grade, that they have to have access to those grade level standards of the next grade. And we know that students will have some holes from the spr from this spring. So if we have a master schedule that allows for the time to hit those holes, then we'll be able to move kids forward as well as keep them caught up from this spring's um, lack of instruction or closure period. Uh, we're also having our teachers plan their units of study. So UOS stands for units of study with intervention. So intervention is based on those priority standards. And what we want our teachers to do is plan their units of study to build in time to reteach our grade level standards for kids who don't get them the first time or the second time. That they have cons they we have that built in so that we don't have as many kids falling in the remediation bucket as we do now. Um, all of these things we had planned to do. Uh, we were just taking them rather slowly. Like I said, we're putting them on speed now. We're putting them on, uh, we're giving them a little steroid injection in order to keep moving because we know these things are going to happen. What I'm trying to tell our leadership team and our teachers is that we have, in times of, of um, a lot of questions, we need to go to our, our highest level of clarity. And this is the clarity that we need to have in order to move our kids forward. So our other two buckets, collective responsibility and collaborative practices. Like I said before, this is all very complicated work and we cannot do it by ourselves. There's the one room schoolhouse or a bunch of teachers sharing a parking lot does not work. We need to work in professional learning communities where we're collaborating on what, what we're gonna teach and how we're gonna formally assess it and how we're gonna look at that data and how we're gonna reteach again. Um, it includes the social emotional learning needs for kids. We know kids are gonna be across the spectrum on their social emotional needs when they come in. There are some kids, like my two kids are having a dream of a time. They are not traumatized at any in any way over this, this crisis. They're having a great time. They just are, right? I know other kids though, who are really struggling with this period of time and having a hard time and are depressed and are anxious and are anxious to come back into school. We have a wide gamut of what kids are gonna need. And so we're gonna plan for that now. We have a social emotional district team who's working on those, uh, the intervention and the remediation piece of this. And we have teachers planning of how are we gonna do this in the classroom to make sure that all kids are accessing the social emotional learning needs. We're really prioritizing executive skills, ex executive functioning skills like organization and, and that kind of thing. Because if we have to remove, if we have to move from in-person to remote, then we truly have to have kids who can work independently, who know where their stuff is, who all of those executive functioning skills. So we're, we're highlighting those pieces as well. Um, they're gonna be planning those units of study. They're gonna be working in the interventions teams. And then high quality instruction for every classroom. This is a huge bucket. And if we were in normal times, this is where all of our work would be focusing next year uh, in a wide gamut. But because we have to focus in, because there's so many needs right now, what we have to focus in on is that we're really focusing in on how do we create high quality, engaging learning opportunities that, that it doesn't matter what the learning context, context is, that it can be flexible. We can do it in person. We could do it remotely. We could do it in a hybrid. So our teams are going to be working together. They're going to do it in workshops together. And they're also going to be in their teaching planning teams to, to think about what does it look like to have very flexible experiences for kids. So that's what we're working on June 12th through 19th. Again, we're moving to our highest level of clarity. 
good teaching is good teaching. We need to be flexible and agile and we need to give kids time for learning. So, so time is the variable and not learning. Learning is the definite into our schedules. Um, I'm going to stop for a second because I just talked a whole lot and I can talk about this forever. So <laughs> give you a second just to process and ask any questions you might have. So Libby, this is Jerry. Um, for, I guess for all kids, um, but is part of what the social emotional learning needs, would that include um, maybe some ways to calm their anxiety, yeah. uh, that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. We've, we've spent Mary Bechtel, who some of the board has met before in other board meetings, um, has worked with our social emotional district team to have prioritized standards in social emotional learning. And some of those standards are how do I, how do I handle different emotions and, and anxiety is certainly one of them. Okay. How do I do that proactively and how do I ask for help and how do I hint? Yeah. So we're, we're focusing in on that big time. Okay, good. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions or discussions on this part? I had a question about the master schedule. Um, yep. You said you don't have it. Do you have, do you have um, time for that? At, like at the high school, for example, is one building it do it? one building doing it better than others or provided more time than others right now. Yeah. Before we went into closure actually. Yeah. Um, so MSMS has actually the, the, um, the schedule with the best intervention. It's called an intervention block right now. Um, it's not daily. It's moving to daily next year be because we think the need's going to be greater than it has been. Um, but that intervention block has been very targeted, particularly in math at MSMS for the last couple of years, uh, led a lot by Pam and Amy Kimball, the math coach there. Um, so they're just, they're making it bigger at MSMS because we think the need's going to be bigger. At the high school, they have what's called Solon block and they're totally, right now, the, the guiding coalition, which is the administration and the teacher leadership team, are really are redesigning soul and block um, so that kids are scheduled where they need to go. Right now it's a little bit of a free for all. It hasn't, they knew they needed to put one in the last couple of years, but it hasn't come to fruition because it hasn't been tightened enough. So now the high school is really working on how do we, how do we control it and how do we tighten it up and how do we provide the enrichment opportunities in an independent way for kids so that they can, they can work on, personalized projects or whatever it is that they're working on an enrichment capacity and the kids who need more reteaching or remediation get that support in a very targeted way as well. Um, at UES, they used to have an intervention block. They didn't, they haven't for many years um, and we're bringing that back. And right now, Ryan with his leadership team is working on how do you do that? And Cause there's give and takes to it. If you're adding time into a class, into a master schedule, then you're taking time away from something else. And so how do we do that and not take too much time around the incredibly important time with reading, writing, math, science, social studies, art, music, all those kind of things. So they're playing around with different ways they can do it right now, but they know that they have to do it. We have to have the time in our schedule for that. RVS has never actually had an intervention block as far as I know. Um, I could be corrected on that. But um, so and RVS is so small that it may look very different than what it does now. Um, so, so we're still working in our elementary schools to see how we can make that happen. Um, that's great. I love, you know, I've worked at a few different schools and we've done intervention blocks different in different ways. And I think one of the really important things to sort of key into, and I'll just say it for the record, is that, um, you know, I think we tend to do remediation and intervention really well as teachers but it's the other side of the spectrum when kids have already met grade level standards in something, the enrichment block doesn't really feel so enriching for them. Yeah, what do we do with the enrichment? Exactly, that's exactly right. And one of the things, Emma, that we're really focusing on now, um, or that we're trying to focus on now, is that our highest trained professionals are working with the kids who need us most, um, and our, and with our enrichment work, we're setting the, the framework for kids, but particularly our older kids. And we're putting our instructional assistant staff there 
to say, help facilitate that process. But really, this should be an independent learning opportunity for kids who have already mastered what we need them to master. Um, and it should be a way for them to dig in, which connects back to those executive functioning skills. And how exactly do you do that? How do you organize your time? And how do you, you know, all of that kind of thing. So it's all closely connected to each other. Any other questions about the teacher stays those, that during that six day time period? Are you running into any obstacles with like contract or agreed schedules or things like that for planning for the fall? <laughs> for the fall? <laughs> for those six days? No. For the fall, that's yet to be determined. <laughs> for the fall, we don't know yet. We'll get to that in a second. Hold that question, Jill, okay? Um, so the other things we're talking about uh, is that we are going to tell every teacher that or teacher team that they have to have a Google Classroom up to date and running because we don't know if we'll have to go into remote quickly. And if we have to go into remote quickly, we need teachers to be prepped for that. They're not going to have days to plan it. Um, so we're asking all classrooms to have Google Classroom. We've we're assuming that's the platform that most of our teachers use anyway, um, which is why we didn't dig into other platforms. We just went with what we know and what is easy. And then the other thing is we were hoping that since families, um, if most teachers use that now anyway, families will be more aware of that. And we're also planning for the fall some family trainings around Google Classroom so that families will be um, understanding of how to do that. So we just want that ease of entry in case we have to do remote. Um, and, it, and I just want to put out to that Google Classroom is an organizational tool. It is a bucket to house things. It is not an, in, it's not where, it's not instruction. It's the organizational tool for, for where we house things. And then of course, through the 12th through the 19th, we need some time to celebrate <laughs> with our teachers. We have a lot of amazing retirees and we need some time to show them off for each other. And we also need some time to just say, we made it through. <laughs> so we will put some time in there to celebrate with each other as well, virtually, of course, which is not nearly as fun as in person. <laughs> um, so that's June 12th through the 19th. Um, I put all this in there because I wanted to make sure the community was aware we're putting that time to good use. Uh, again, we're going for our highest level of clarity. And that's what good quality teaching and learning, all the pieces we need for good quality teaching and learning to happen. All right, there's no questions, I'll keep going. Um, so we have some more decision points to make in that planning process. This is a very small list. We have, right now there's more questions than answers by far. Um, so we're not sure about building use. Uh, Right now, we are not allowed to open our buildings or our fields for anybody outside of school activities. And school activities should be li are limited to the most critical need. Um, so for critical need populations. We just yesterday made the decision uh, to do our extended year services for our students with special needs remotely instead of in person. Uh, it's getting hard to get staffing for in-person support. The cleaning responsibilities are immense. And uh, when we surveyed families who uh, may qualify for ESY, not many of them really wanted to do in-person. So we've decided to do that remotely. Uh, there is some big um, pieces around building use. The rec really wanted to use our buildings for their summer camps, and we had to tell them no, which was not a popular decision. Um, but we're not allowed to yet, and we simply don't have the custodial crew to have um, the work shifts in order to clean our buildings the way that the requirements are right now. Uh, transportation is a big conundrum right now, and it's one that the school I will be coming to the school board to talk more about. Uh, the scheduling, physical distancing requirements, how do you do that with kids? Uh, and health screening requirements, masks, students who refuse to come to school, parents who refuse to send their kids to school, teachers who refuse to come to work. Um, all of these things are going to be big questions. The idea of shared materials, isolation rooms for kids who are sick, 
it goes on and on. It's, it's really an endless list right now. And we're awaiting guidance from the Department of Health and the Agency of Education. We just haven't gotten that yet. So hopefully that will be coming soon and we'll be able to start planning. But to help all of these things, uh, Andrew and I are going to be, we were asked to participate in a planning group with Visbit, which is our insurance company, to determine best practices. We had one workshop on that yesterday. We're going to another tomorrow. And then we're also part of a, part of a very small group, pilot group to, to name the practices that we want to have in place. Uh, the Vermont Superintendents Association has created a document to help the state make decisions. Uh, we're at our third pressure point for um, helping the state make those decisions. The first being the decision to close. The second was the list of dates that we needed decisions by, which were not, um, didn't happen. And the, now we've created as an association, uh, um, not a list of decisions that we need made, but the de actual decisions and say, this is the decisions we'd like to make, uh, respond to it. That has not been um, answered yet by our state um, decision makers. And then um, as Jim and I were talking the other day, we need to have, and I'm gonna put it in, we're gonna put it on the retreat agenda mostly, but a big discussion about the school board's role going forward. I feel that your role going forward is absolutely imperative, um, particularly after the survey data that has come out because there is no agreement of what we should do next year. There, there just isn't in our community or in our teaching staff. And so, um, so we're going to need to be one in those decisions, and the school board is going to um, very much need to know the rationale behind every decision the, the administration makes um, and be a part of that decision so that you can help us communicate that to the community. Um, so we're going to spend some time in the retreat about just what the school board's role is in that and how you can you can help us as we move forward. and. And quite honestly, what is an impossible task going forward, the way it is in my mind right now anyway. <laughs> and, oh, so just to make sure that you all are in the know, I just mentioned this, that um, under the guidance that we have for the AOE, our schools are allowed to be used for summer for over the summer for students who are entitled to supports who, or who require critical supports to so students with special needs. Again, we're, we're providing those ESY services remotely. We do have part two started this week to provide childcare for a very small population of families at UES. I believe we have nine families there this year, or nine kids there this week. And it's growing a little bit each week as we go forward, but we do have childcare set up. It's not camp, it's childcare. Um, and then, uh, our schools are not allowed to be used by outside entities. So we have turned down capital soccer. We've turned down the recreation department, um, except the, and those, those requests are coming in. Our, our, our community definitely sees our schools as a community asset, as do I. Um, and right now we need to really focus our efforts on opening those buildings and getting them ready for the fall. And the AOE has not allowed us to open our buildings to any kind of outside agency yet. Our graduation ceremonies are coming up. I believe they're starting next week, right, Anna? Over the whole week, um, we're going to have that soccer field, the big stage and a big tent, and kids are coming up. We're doing eighth grade and we're doing our seniors, um, and moving up ceremonies are being planned in more virtual formats that may come later than the end of the school year, but uh, before next school year. So those are in, those are in, in the planning mode right now. So I'm up for questions, concerns, or any discussion the board has about any of that. That was a lot of information I just threw at you. Libby, I had a question about um, the tech issues around next year and the possibility, as you were, you were mentioning, of having to transition quickly to remote. And I know one there were issues around getting, you know, getting kids with Chromebooks and the Chromebooks kind of up and running. Is there a is there an easier fix to that so that we could be ready? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so we just put a $30,000 order in to a local vendor for um, Chromebooks. So the plan already was to be one-to-one with kids taking taking devices home and not for nine through 12. That one-to-one will increase significantly next year. Um, we're using, we just got some guidance on planning for that CARES money. We don't know how we're, how much we, we don't know our allotment and we don't know how to apply for it, but we just got a, a planning guideline for it today. Um, so with that money, we're also planning to, on buying more Chromebooks. The problem is, is that every school in the state is also, or every school in the nation really is also buying Chromebooks. So it's take, taking a while for it to get here. And they're all coming from China, which is not the quickest route. Um, so uh, we have plans to ensure that every kid has access to a device. Whether or not that comes to fruition depends on if we can get them here in time. But yeah, the one of the, it, and we, knowing what we know now, we'll be able to dis- to put on the laptops a way for kids to access it at home or at school. That was one of the big conundrums that we had in the beginning of this is that the Chromebooks were only going to work at school. So that's changed at this point. Libby, if we have uh, some kind of hybridized approach next year where you, you have some kids in class, some kids participating from home have we thought i i imagine mike has i imagine you have but um has there been any thought about what kind of approach would take um to doing something like that in terms of technology required and things like that yeah we're starting those conversations from now i'm going to tell you honestly i hope that doesn't have to happen i'm, I'm just going to be honest about that yeah i hope um, so too because it's, it adds so many complicated layers. Um, we, I can't see us doing that for our youngers, quite honestly, because they, um, cause it's a different level of independence and, and childcare challenges. Uh, and if schools do that across the state, our teachers don't all live in Montpelier and they don't have all have kids that who are in the same grade level as they are. So it, it not only provides a childcare conundrum for our parents and our community, but it also provides a significant challenge for our teachers. Um, so I really hope that doesn't happen, particularly for our youngers. And then you look on the other side, people, a lot of people have said, well, just do that for our older kids. Well, our survey day is quite clear. The social interaction is, is of utmost importance and we can't, we can't belittle that. So. I have similar, I have different worries about our, our upperclassmen as I do for our little. So um, I'm going to tell you, I don't know right now. We, we're starting to talk about that. And, and I really hope we don't have to do that. Okay. So this spring, formal evaluation of the students' proficiencies and all the content areas was suspended in a sense. If we aren't to be in person all of next fall, all of next school year, have teachers been talking about how evaluation will be happening, um, kind of going between different models or in a more- That's one of the reasons, Ryan, that we're really focused on prioritizing our standards to just six, because when we're talking about reporting out and evaluating students to the commute to families and things, then we're just focusing on those those standards that we're guaranteeing for kids, the most important ones, not the nice to know ones, but the most important ones. This district has never really done that. There's too many of them. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're really focusing in on prioritizing those standards. And yes, we should we have to go remote or some sort of hybrid in the in the future, then we will not be doing what we're doing now. It will look it will look different. It will have to look different. We we have too many responsibilities to our kids. Okay, thanks. Libby, you you mentioned that the CDC guidelines have come out, and you your team has been keeping those in mind, I guess, or using them as some guidance. Could you comment, just even in general terms, about you know your reaction to those, what what they might mean if that was really the standard for 
the fall? <laughs> uh, yep, I can. Um, <laughs> and it's hard for me to do it between being a, taking my parent hat on and my educator hat on and my safe superintendent hat on. Um, the CDC guidelines are scary and not written by educators um, and not written by people who know kids. And, and so um, I understand them. I understand why they are written the way they are. They are not different from anything else we all have heard as communities across this entire period of time. Um, to and they are self-contradictory and impossible to execute. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> Mara said it very well. <laughs> um, to put six-year-olds in a room, I challenge anybody to keep them six feet apart. Uh, to put 16-year-olds in a room, I challenge any of them to keep them six feet apart. Um, they, so we're going to have to figure out we're going to have to, if, if those are what rule, we're going to have to figure out how to do that best by age level is all I, is all I'm thinking about right now. Um, we cannot put our eight year olds in the under, and I'm using eight as an arbitrary number. We can't put them in a mask all day. They, it's just not fair to them and it's not right. And it's, so we can't. So how do we spread them out if we need to spread them out in a way that makes sense? Um, we don't, I, as I said to the secretary of education last Thursday, we don't have desks that has been eliminated from our disc. We haven't bought desks in years. So we did a count, for instance, we have 420 desks in our district. We have over 1200 students. So how do you, how do you do that? Our rooms are different sizes. I, there's so many unknowns of if we take those recommendations by the word, we can't do it. There's no way we can do it. Um, if we take them and say, thank you for the guidance, we're gonna do the best we can and keep our kids as safe as possible, then we can probably do an okay job. Um, as a parent, I'm just gonna say as a parent, I have a 12 year old and a nine year old. I do not want my kids sitting in a row for four hours looking in the same direction with very anxious adults saying, go wash your hands every two seconds when they sneeze. I mean, it's really, it's really hard for me as a parent and it's for like to follow these guidelines as a superintendent. And I understand what people are saying when they say we're going to traumatize kids more by following these CDC guidelines. I totally get it. I, um, so it's going to be really hard. And I'm going to be looking to our department of health to say those CDC guidelines are written for the nation. And there are many different parts of our nation who are struggling with this in a different way than Montpelier and Roxbury, Vermont are. Um, and so how can, how can we design our system to yes, keep our staff and students safe and um, respond to the co context in which we live as Montpelierites and Roxburyites, if that's a word, <laughs> um, is, is a piece that I keep thinking about. Go ahead, Emma. Um, do you have any concept of what, you know, like, so if the Vermont Department of Health issues different guidelines as of fall, um, and then we as a school board sort of decide what we're going to do with those guidelines, is there, um, are there any repercussions if we aren't following them to a T? I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do because they haven't, the agency of we haven't heard anything from the Department of Health, nothing, um, except for what everybody else in Vermont has heard from the Department of Health. Um, from the Agency of Education, it is very hard to figure out if they're going to go very definitive guidelines that you have as, that are have tos, or if they're going to go with with generalizations that you can make decisions on localized context. Quite honestly, both of them scare the bejesus out of me, and because if we can make decisions based on our localized contract context, we will be compared to other school districts. And, and because of the vast opinion of what we should be doing in the community, there will be not be very many happy, you know, like it's, it's just an impossible piece. We'll, we will be compared based on what others are doing. However, if it's a very strict and rigid understanding of the guidelines, then 
that may not be if it's if it's a very conservative um, and I don't mean that in the political sense I mean that in the restrictive sense then that may not be what we deem is best for our kids either. So it's, it's real, and then that puts us in liability issue if we don't follow them willingly. So um, we're gonna, I think it's a wait and see game right now. It's a wait and see game to see what comes at us from the Department of Health and the, the Agency of Education. I participated in your, um, I think it was a, called a town hall on, for parents mm -hmm. about returning to school. And um, I just thought there was a lot of really creative, I, I felt like the general um, feeling from the community was compassion for the school district to have to face these, you know, impossible decisions and impossible guidelines. And then also there was a lot of creative, you know, wrapping our brains collectively around what this could potentially look like. Um, and so I get, I get that vibe from the community that people are open to creative solutions. Yeah. And that's where I think it was Jill. Jill, did you ask earlier about the teacher contract? Is that you? <laughs> that's where that comes into play. <laughs> cause, cause we are getting a lot of, and we're having a lot of, um, creative suggestions and, um, we also have a teacher's contract. So, so staggering schedules and school day and that um, flies in the face of the 7.30 to 3 contracted hours that's written in our con So there's a lot of negotiation that happens. Andrew, you better start getting nice with your negotiation skills. Ryan, start wearing off on him. What, what do you mean I'm nice? <laughs> <laughs> because I think we're going to, I we've, the partnership between uh, myself and the teachers union thus far has been amazing. Our teachers union has been incredibly supportive and has worked hard to make this work. We've collaborated really well together. That only has to continue and strengthen over the next couple months. And I can say, honest, I, I, I am um, not worried because I, I know the other leaders so well. But we, losing Laura Slesser, um, who is going to work for the NEA in, in a bigger capacity, is great for the NEA, but it's it's tough for Montpelier Roxbury. Go ahead, Jill. I don't even know where to begin because you did just give us so much information. But um, I I find the survey stuff so far really fascinating, as you can tell, and the the piece you said about the parents and the spectrum tells me that as a board, you know, I think this is such a huge social experiment. We don't really know what's going to happen, but as a board, it seems like the two things that we could do for you are, um, support, you know, with clear and unified messages, the piece that you just walked us through, which as a parent, I find that really, um, comforting and I'm excited about it because you guys have put a lot of work into that already. So as a board, we're going to really need to sort of carry that message and be unified and back it up with the facts, because even within households, parents are in different places with how this is going to go. So there's no winning. Um, and I do think that if there's a way we can kind of take some of those slings and arrows this fall, that, that I'm willing to do that. And then the other piece is where can we help to provide flexibility for some of these pieces? Maybe we can't, maybe it's not really something the board can control, but that seems like there's going to be need, there's going to need to be flexibility about space and about resources and about transportation and about use of people. And if there are things that as a board we can do to either get out of the way or try to help clear the way, then, you know, sometimes you have to spell things out for me. So please do tell me if there are things that as a board we can do, because this is all unprecedented and, and whatever we can do to help, keep you and, and the educators focused on these really good pieces, the better off the whole district will be. Yeah, I think so. So far, the decisions have had to be around teaching and learning, right, which is our domain. Moving forward, the logistical decisions, we're going to we're going to need to discuss that as like as an administration, straight group and as a school board, um, because I, I feel and I, I don't, I'm not talking out of turn with Jim not here. I know Jim feels that we all need to be completely, um, everybody needs to understand the rationale for the decisions that are gonna come forward so that we can help, we can all help explain why decisions are being made to the community. I think there's a big 
misunderstanding by some people that I am making these decisions. I've made the decision to close school. The administrators have made it, and, and that's just not the case, right? And so moving forward, as our guidelines come out, whether they're broad or strict, it needs to be, like, we need to be very clear that, that whatever we do as a school board and as an administrative team and as a district, that we are responding to the rules that are being put in place for us by others in, in government and health. Any more questions for Libby? So many. <laughs> <laughs> me too, Emma, me too. <laughs> I'll just hold them for now. <laughs> <laughs> Libby, that was, that was really great, thank you. We so appreciate the, the explanation, but also the underlying work, um, which is clear. You and your team and the teachers are putting so much time into this, so thanks. Uh, I think the last thing on the agenda is planning for the retreat. Um, that's the, that part I'm a little bit at a disadvantage because I'm, I assume that Jim and Libby probably had some discussion yep. about that ahead of time. Yep, I can talk about that. Okay. So, um, uh, so the retreat is every June 12th from 1230 to 4. Anna is, is talking to Orca to see if we can get them recorded. We do have the library reserved. Um, and so there are nine board members plus me, that's 10. Um, so we are within our guidelines. If you want to come to the library, we can make sure that, that we um, have a safe environment. Uh, we'll be separated, physically distanced, um, and it is a very clean environment, believe me. <laughs> um, so if you'd like to do that, we can make that happen. If you want to make, if you want to do it virtually, we can make that happen as well. So I would just ask that you email Anna and myself so that we can prepare for either option, and we know how to set up the space based on who's going to come to MHS Library. Um, we have at one thirty Sue McCormick, and I'm going to look up her name because I just learned it today. Hold on one second, Keisha, Keisha Ram. Yeah, Keisha Ram. Keisha Ram. Um, Keisha Ram. Is it Ram? I think she corrected it, me on that. Really? Every everywhere I've been, she's Ram. But okay. Mara we knows her. All be We're gonna Ram. go with that. <laughs> We're gonna go with that. It's Keisha. I'm gonna Google to see how she says it. Okay. <laughs> um, so we we have Sue McCormick and Keisha coming. Um, I've worked with Sue before. I haven't worked with Keisha. Obviously, Mara has. <laughs> um, and I contacted them to potentially facilitate discussions around visioning. Um, so there's two folds here. The first part is getting, doing a community outreach for the values of the community for the school system in Montpelier and Roxbury. And then the secondary piece is visioning for the future of Roxbury in, in particular. Um, so Jim and I both felt that we needed a, a big time for professional facilitator to do that. I've worked with Sue McCormick in the past, and so I reached out to her. She's a phenomenal facilitator, the kind of person where you just watch and you're like, I wish I could do that. Um, and uh, she brought in Keisha to bring a different perspective to the, to the room. Um, she asked if we wanted that um, from a more diverse, um, inclusive perspective. And I said that the board would be absolutely behind that. So I hope you don't mind me speaking for you on your, on your behalf for that. Um, but Keisha has been working with Sue. And so both um, Sue and Keisha are gonna come and work with the board for about an hour um, around this process, explain what their vision is for the process. Um, and you all get to decide if you wanna work with them or not, but it's, it's just kind of the opening pitch for, from Sue and Keisha around what they, um, see the processes going forward for both of those things, getting real solid va values down from the communities of Montpelier and Roxbury and then the, the future of Roxbury Village School. Um, so that's for about an hour of the retreat. Um, and then I believe we need to really dig into the parent-teacher 
student survey data around this whole experience in fall 2020. So you all see all the survey data that we have and have a really good discussion about uh, board's role in making future decisions around fall 2020. And then we talked about, I just wrote down my notes. And I wanna make sure that I have um, just having a really clear discussion um, around board's expectation with diversity, equity, and inclusion work of the district. So those were the three big topics. Rich, do you want me to go into any more detail or does that sound good? I mean, that sounds good to me. That sounds like more than four hours. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, is there anything we want yeah, to do? Jill? With that in mind, is there anything that you want us as board members to do to prepare for that? Are there particular things we should look at? I'm gonna um, I'm gonna work on the agenda Friday, Friday this week, and probably Monday. Um, so we'll try to get that out to you as quickly as we can by hopefully Monday afternoon. Um, so if there are things to look at beforehand, then we'll let we'll let you know on that. Other questions or comments on the retreat schedule? No, but it is Keisha Ram. Is it? Okay, thanks, Mara. Have you worked with her before? Yeah, and we're really lucky to get to do work with her. Okay, have you worked with Sue before? I have heard the name, but okay. that's it. She's fantastic. It sounds like it's going to be a really productive and exciting four hours. Um, so we'll look forward to that. And that it doesn't substitute for the next board meeting. Is that right? Uh, I believe Jim's plan is to substitute it for the next board meeting. Yes. Oh, it is. That is the plan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I don't want to speak for him. The last time we talked, that was the plan. Okay. I so think maybe having that longer. finalized, <laughs> maybe having that finalized by Friday or so would be good too, to just know yeah. that the next meeting is, the next regularly scheduled meeting is coming off the calendar, if it is. Right. Yeah, I can okay. clarify that with Jim. I've taken it off my calendar already. So <laughs> I hope I'm right. Is it, is it possible that we will need a negotiations executive session at some point that we might get into trouble without having that other meeting? We could also always call. We've done it in the past. We've called emergency meetings. Yep. I mean, we can do that. I just wanted to flag it as something that might happen depending on the timing of the negotiations. Yep. Do we want to do a second session tonight for updates or anything? Well, I think we can provide a general public update right now, which is that we settled with the teachers and I think it went really well. And, you know, we, we voiced our support for them and um, I thought it ended really well. Let me think something mean because of one incident, but <laughs> I was very nice at the last negotiation session. <laughs> Um, Did yeah, you say so, we settled? We'd like to give you a hard yeah. time, manager. <laughs> That's a pretty we, big update. Yeah, we settled with the teachers without going to mediation, and so it's a very positive mm -hmm. thing. And um, they're they're appreciative of our support, and we're appreciative of the work that they're doing, and you know, appreciative that the administration was able to work budget wonders to be able to support our teachers while still. Um, keeping things um, flexible for us heading into a difficult budget climate. So good job all around everyone. Yeah. Good job to the team. Thank you guys. And yeah. to the teachers. Many the thanks text to them. messages I received from the teachers immediately after that made me, made me quite happy. They were very happy. And Anything then else? we have, we have, I, we have asked me, tomorrow and we have the IA's uh, MESA next week. That's right. Correct? Yep. Correct. Okay. I think if there's, if no one else has any questions or wants are to weigh in, we can move to adjourn. About the uh, next Friday's meeting location, is it gonna be online? Are we, when we be no, I, I mean, I'm okay either ways. Um, I'm j I, I'd just like to, I just wanna know when we're talking. Right. So let me, let me try to see if I, I it, it, it sounds like we have a physical location at the high school and so we're expecting that some people are likely to at least come who want to come, but people who want to participate remotely can participate remotely. Is it going to work 
to do that, Libby, do you think? I mean, it's yeah. hard. I'm just envisioning that if you have 10 people spread out really far apart, or it wouldn't be 10 if some are remote, you know, six people spread out really far apart and you're trying to engage people remotely. Yeah, we were talking about that today a little bit. And uh, I think we can probably, we can make it work if we have Orca's mics, if Orca can join us and has their mic set up in terms of the remote piece. Um, we, we were actually debating that for a little while today <laughs> about if we can make it work. I think we can. Um, but the challenge is, as, as Bridge, you know, you've been here for a while, um, is that when we've had retreats in the past, we haven't had Orca do it. We haven't had Orca there, except people could always come to the location. We've never, we haven't had people come, but they could, right? Whereas now they can't really come. So <laughs> that's, that's the bigger challenge, I think, is how do we ensure that it's a public meeting? So one, one idea, and I didn't come up with this, I heard this on a podcast last week um, from a tech exec, is even for people who are in the same room and meeting there, but who are meeting with people elsewhere, um, being in your own tile is still extremely helpful. And so what we might consider doing, I'm just proposing this, not saying that we should do this, is um, if we each had our own laptop, you could have Zoom open so that people could see you. And, you know, Orca could pick up the feed that way as well. Um, so it would be kind of a hybrid approach between what we're doing now, but some of us being in the same room where, you know, we could be, you might see the side, more of like the side of somebody's heads, but we kind of do that with different monitors anyways. Would that be hard for people if they, if you wanted to come to bring a laptop? I wouldn't mind that myself. And picturing that, and I think for the next six months, that's going to kind of be how we all re-enter. Different people have different abilities or comfort level. I think it's going to have to be part of the, the learning. I'm happy to do that. It doesn't create like a feedback loop problem because of the... That's my only concern, yeah. Well, if you, if you mute the mic on a personal device and if Arca is there picking up the sound feed, right, that would, that would uh, resolve that issue. There's usually a delay with Orca, though, so it gets pretty funky with the audio. Um, hmm. We have oh, no. Mary and Anne, who are professionals here. They can start working on it. They can think about that <laughs> for us. <laughs> I was also wondering about the potential of meeting outside instead of inside, but it sounds like the Orca Media piece sort of answers that question. It would be more challenging for them from a technical standpoint. Yeah, if Orca is allowed to come, that's the reason why it's always at the Montpelier High School Library is because Orca's, um, that's the only place besides Roxbury Library that we can really do it. And even Roxbury Library, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, and Jerry, but I don't think that's a live stream if we're in Roxbury. I think it's a recording. Yeah. You're right, they, they replay it later. Yeah. It's recorded and then played later. It's not live from the village school. Whereas in the library at the high school, it can be a live feed. Okay. So Another I, option I, would be to do one camera somewhere with, and uh, just so you can, if somebody's remote, they can at least see the room instead of just seeing one person. So they'll see a visual of a, of all the different people in the room. I mean, it'll be far away, but it's, that's helpful. I can bring my kid's video camera, Anna. You can be video camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have one you guys can borrow if you, I mean, just a, it's just a, an HD. Yeah, that's what we have. For a laptop. Yeah, but, um, but you can at least see the whole room. So you could have one, you know, just the regular mic setup, but have that one camera. Well, it sounds like maybe we should engage with Orca on this after this meeting to see. Yeah, Anna's in close, Anna's like best friends with Orca now, so she's in close connection with them and figuring that out. Awesome, thanks Anna. I also think, and I, I don't wanna put people on the spot here, but I think, you know, it's probably helpful for people to think about whether they want to come, to have a sense of whether most, mm -hmm 
most of us want to come, all of us want to come, none of us particularly want to come. <laughs> and um, kind of give that feedback to Libby and Jim so we know we know where right. people's comfort level is. Guys, it might, might not even be uh, something we need to do when we find out who's coming and who's not. Or if anyone's not coming, then we don't need to worry about it. Do you want to do that now, Bridget? I, I don't really want to put people on the spot right now. Um, okay. I, I think we should let people think about it and email you and Jim with yeah. kind of where they're where they're landing on it. Sounds good. Could we chat it to you now if we know? <laughs> Go for it, Mara. <laughs> I this to it's everyone still can chat right here. Like. Still trap. <laughs> <laughs> is the chat public for? Or you no? can privately chat, chat is public. Me. Oh. I'm, I think that might still be a public record, though. Just, just FYI. I yeah. feel comfortable with that. <laughs> it might also be interesting to see what um, Sue and and Keisha, what how they think about facilitating us in both scenarios. Yeah, I think they'll respond to whatever we want. They're planning as of right now. At least Sue is. I have I haven't asked Keisha directly. So I was just talking to her about her name, Mara, which is funny. <laughs> Not so much feel steel trap with names. Um, the Sue was planning on coming to Montpelier if if she if we want her to. She will also do Zoom. She's fine doing that. Um, but she was she said she would come if if we want her to. Okay. I think probably we can adjourn at this point. Um no other pressing business? Motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Thanks. Uh, let's see. What's the order right now? You've got, you guys have moved around on me. Anna, get your first now. <laughs> Hi. I'm in Jill. Yes. All right, we'll skip Jill, but I think she's saying Hi. Ryan. <laughs> Ryan. Hi. Emma. Hi. Mara. Hi. Derry. Hi. Andrew. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Libby, thanks. and thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for your mediation, Bye. Bridget. And yeah, thank you. Bridget. Good job, Bridge. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.